so-called organized crime, the mafia, uh, La Cosa Nostra. Have you any knowledge at all of that? No, sir. None of, of None any of kind. Have you ever been associated in any way with any illegal activity? No, sir. Now, you're mentioned... Uh, Senator, could you re-ask that question? I don't think he understood it. Yes, sir. Yes. What, what, what were those uh, illegal activities? I gambled. Tell us uh, whether if uh, you have opposition from anybody that you dispose of them by having them stuffed in a trunk. Is that what you do, Mr. Gene Connor? It's mine to answer because I always believe my answer might turn into Can you tell us anything about any of your operations? Or you just... Uh, uh, giggle every time I ask you a question. The client asked because I always believe my answer might turn incriminating. I thought only little girls giggled, Mr. Gene Connor. <laughs> SLB, I'll break his back. They give his speech, I don't even know what I was talking about, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't intend to have the impression left that's been stated publicly that I'm controlled by gangsters. I am not controlled by them. I say you're not tough enough to get rid of these people then. Well, I don't propose to You haven't moved tough. against any of them. I don't propose to act tough, and I will follow the Constitution of the International Union. After that. You must have in your mind some things you've done that you can speak of to your credit as an American citizen. If so, what are they? Pay my tax. Did you have any prior knowledge or did you issue an invitation to Mr. Giancana to come to the lodge? I never invited Mr. Giancana to come to Cotton Lodge. I never entertained him and I never saw him. Well, actually, it started about 1965 when some newspaper man wrote an article that I have $300 million. Well, I wish I had a million dollars. I said many more things remember have been said about me. They accused me of making a president. Stuff. The older we get, the more of it we accumulate. We buy stuff, lose it, find it, and give it away. Once in a while, we find something that's a total surprise. When I found some old 16 millimeter films, a new journey started in my life. Decades later, with the help of the internet for research, I finished the web series, Kidnapped by the Mob, on my YouTube channel, 17 Reasons Why Productions. The web series is where I did the biographies on the 23 plus family friends who visited my grandparents, Alan Mildred Epstein, at their home in Palm Springs, and that my dad names in his voiceover. This documentary is going to focus on one friend, John Jake the Barber Factor and the 1933 kidnapping of his son Jerome, and later Jake Factor himself was kidnapped, as well as relate some of the other scams he and his wife, Rella Cohen Factor, pulled off on two continents, including his ties with the Chicago Outfit, President John Kennedy and his Rat Pack pals, and the Las Vegas Hotel Casino, The Stardust. As one friend said, you couldn't have made this up. How would you feel if you found out your grandparents had a dark past? Hello, my name is Jeff Redlick, and this is a story about my grandparents, my dad, Chicago, and Palm Springs in the 1920s and the 1930s, and the Chicago Outfit. When I was a kid growing up, 
I was fascinated by Al Capone and Chicago gangster stories. When I was 11 years old, The Untouchables was on TV. The Untouchables. A Desilu production. Prohibition 1932. The city of Chicago was consuming alcohol at the rate of 32 million gallons a year. The figures are incredible, but they are documented. 86,000 gallons a day. It was manufactured in everything from massive distilleries to grimy bathtubs. It came into the brawling city by truck and motor car, by pop bottles and flight bottles. I asked my dad one night, who grew up in Chicago, was it really like that? Referring to all the gangsters and the shooting from cars. It was like the Old West growing up in Chicago. The grandmother kept her car garage a few blocks away from where the 1929 St. Valentine's Day Massacre took place. Remember this part about the kidnapping. It's going to come up later on in our story. My friend from college, Jerry Factor and I, were kidnapped one night by gangsters. When they realized they had the wrong guys, they tossed us out of the car. I then asked him, did you know any of these gangsters? He told me. I was in a card game one night with some men who I later found out were high up in the crime organization. I didn't know it at the time because they were all perfect gentlemen. And that was all he ever said about his early life in Chicago. My mom was also quiet about those years. In 1969, after my mom passed away, I found some old 16 millimeter movies in storage. I moved them with me from place to place for over 15 years, never knowing what was on them. Christmas Eve in the 1980s, my dad was over, and he was in his late 70s then. I asked him again. He'd had a couple of vodkas and was pretty relaxed. Did you know any of these gangsters in Chicago in the 20s and the 30s? And this time he said in a low voice, Yes. I can't say why I got interested in those films. Maybe it was something my dad said, and the films were discussed. Whatever it was, my curiosity started to get the better of me. I got access to a 16 millimeter film projector. When I threaded it up and turned it on, the film sprockets started to break. The film was too old and had become brittle. I shut off the projector right away. I got the film treated in a formaldehyde bath at a film lab in San Francisco, California to keep it flexible and from breaking up in the projector. The film was silent, taken at my grandparents Mildred and Al Epstein's residence in Palm Springs. They called the compound the Palms. They had bought the four home compound in Palm Springs, moving from Chicago, with the grant deed dated April 15, 1936, from old property records I found in 2015. I'm guessing these films were taken at a housewarming party in July or August that year. My dad told me his mother had regular brunches, inviting many of the same friends, plus some that weren't there, like Eddie Canner, Al Jolson, Sidney Korshak, and Colonel Jake Arvey. I'd been there as a kid, riding my tricycle around that beautiful swimming pool, getting into everybody's business. There were lots of people in the film. 
Some I recognized and many I did not. I asked my dad if he'd get the films put on VHS tape and do a voiceover naming the people in the film. He was 82 years old when he got around to doing that in 1996. Unfortunately, he and I never sat down and watched this together so I could ask even more questions about who was in those films. In 2014, I got the original film put direct to DVD and imported it into the iMovie editing program and started making a web series. There is Abe Lyman's older brother Mike on the left with the cane with Charlie Carell from Amos and Andy. There's Sophie Tucker, second from the left, with Franny Pritzker. And then the large fellow with a cigar is composer Mac Gordon in Burton Lane. And there's Joey Lewis. There's Abe Pritzker and Fanny with Epi. It's been over 45 years since I first found the films and working from the stories my dad told me when I was a kid about he and his friend Jerry Factor from Chicago getting kidnapped. And using the internet, I found some interesting history on the 23 plus people my dad mentioned in his voiceover. He never went into much detail outside of a few notable friends like Sophie Tucker, Abe and Jack Pritzker, Charlie Carell from Amos and Andy, Judge Abe Maravitz, and Judge Joe Drucker, composer lyricist Burton Lane, Mac Gordon, Eddie and Peter Duchin, and a few more. My grandparents' friends were a mixed group comprised of attorneys, actors, stage entertainers, radio personalities, band leaders, nightclub owners, song composers, judges, politicians, and mobsters. I kept connecting the dots and a picture started to form that surprised me. My step-grandfather, Al Epstein, who was the only grandfather that I ever knew, was involved with all these people, and I couldn't figure out why they all came to Palm Springs as a group. All my dad ever said about Epi was, He was an entertainment attorney, and his offices were down the hall from the Pritzker's offices in Chicago. Let me tell you the story of the con man John Jake the Barber Factor a family friend of my grandparents, and sometimes client of my step-grandfather, Al Epstein, an attorney. I fell into a black hole doing the research on the details of Jake Factor's life. The FBI has a case file on John Jake the Barber Factor titled John Factor. It's 126 pages long and has many redactions. I've asked the FBI for this report in an unredacted version under the Freedom of Information Act back on January 21st in 2015. It's almost been a year and I've yet to receive that document. Something else that got my attention early on. Of all the movie and TV depictions about the 1920s and 1930s and the mob, there is no mention of Jake Factor. As you will learn, he was quite the character. This was my main reason for making this series, to tell the story that's part of history left untold by TV or the movies. It would make a great screenplay. John Jacob Factor was a rabbi's son, born Lakau Factowitz, the youngest of 10 children Jake, as he preferred to be called, was born in England, but was taken to Lotz, Poland before his first birthday, where he lived until he was 11 years old. He ranks as one of the most successful swindlers of all time. Jake's older half-brother, Max Factor, would go on to create an international cosmetic empire. Jake got his nickname because he worked at his brother's barbershop. 
then later cut hair at Chicago's Morrison Hotel to help support his parents. In 1923, Jake Factor got in a partnership with the great New York criminal genius Arnold Rothstein, the same mobster who rigged the 1919 World Series and became a kingpin for the Jewish mob in New York City, as well as partnering with Chicago's Al Capone. Rothstein put up $50,000 that Factor needed to set up a stock scam in England that fleeced thousands of investors, including the royal family, out of $1.1 million. Early in 1925, Rothstein bankrolled Jake in another swindle. At the heart of the swindle was the Tyler Wilson & Company stock brokerage firm that Factor had invented. Then, without warning, Jake the Barber closed Tyler Wilson & Company and fled England with an estimated 1,619,000 pounds, or about $8 million. An incredible sum of money in the Depression. Kidnapping number one. Two days before Jake Factor was due to appear before the Supreme Court, on April 16, 1933, Jake the Barber's 20-year-old son, Jerome, was kidnapped in Chicago. Jerry Factor and my dad Charles were friends from Northwestern. I don't think this is the kidnapping my dad referred to when I was a kid. That was kidnapping two, and that was on July 1st, but more about that later on. A ransom note arrived asking for $50,000 from Jerome's kidnappers, who worked for Roger Tui, a competing gang to Al Capone's outfit. They were Buck Henriksen, a former Cook County Highway Patrolman, and now a down-on-his-luck gambler and heavy drinker, Jim Wagner, the bookkeeper for Tui, and George Wilkie, Tui's business manager. Jerome's dad, Jake, was highly visible in Chicago. Newspapers put his net worth at $20 million. Murray Humphreys, the labor plunderer for Al Capone's outfit, and also Jake Barber's close friend, led the negotiations with the kidnappers from a suite adjoining Factor's room. Chicago police raided a suite in the Congress Hotel, which the press dubbed the Hoodlum Detective Agency, and arrested the heirs to the Capone Syndicate, Murray Humphreys, Machine Gun Jack McGurn, Sam Golfbag Hunt, Tony Accardo, Frankie Rio, Phil DeAndrea, Rocco de Grazia, and half a dozen other mob hanger-ons. All of whom told the police the same thing. They were there because they'd been brought in by Murray Humphreys to secure Jerome Factor's safe return. The cops locked them up on vagrancy charges, but within an hour, Jake Factor posted their bail, and all were released. After eight days in captivity, Jerome Factor was released on a Chicago street unharmed. Many people in Chicago simply assumed that Jerome, the good son, had agreed to a kidnapping rig by his father and Murray Humphreys to delay the U.S. Supreme Court hearing. With Jerome Factor returned home safely, Jake's appointment to appear before the United States Supreme Court was put back on the docket. Jake Factor got the idea from Jerome's kidnapping that if he faked his own kidnapping, he could run the clock out on extradition to England. Jake pitched his idea to Murray Humphreys, who told the acting boss Frank Nitti and outfit counsel Paul Rica about it. Nitti and Rica both liked it. Rica got the idea to frame Roger Tui for Jake's kidnapping. Nitti did not want any of the syndicate's own people involved. Humphreys learned from Sam Hare, the owner of the Dell's nightclub casino, that Jerome's kidnappers were Henriksen and Wilkie. With this tip, Humphrey, or one of his men, approached Henriksen and brought him to Chicago at gunpoint. Murray threatened Henriksen that he would tell Henriksen's boss, Roger Tui, 
that he was involved with Jerome's kidnapping. And Rickson knew that Tui would seek revenge. Murray Humphreys eventually offered Henriksen another choice. Jake Factor wanted to kidnap himself and the outfit wanted Roger Tui to take the fall for the kidnapping. Humphreys, by enlisting Walter Buck Henriksen, who would not only get to live, but he could also make some easy money. Factor paid $70,000 to fake his kidnapping. Henriksen used some of that money to hire at least nine men to work the scam. They would fake the kidnapping and take Jake Factor to a safe house for a couple of weeks and then release him to the streets of Chicago. Jake would blame Roger Tui for the kidnapping. Buck Henriksen got one of Tui's bodyguards, Eddie Schwabauer, to go along with the scam and keep Jake Factor at his mother's house, where he was living with his children after his wife left him. The second kidnapping has a lot of moving parts. I found several newspapers from 1933 and even one from 1960, which contained interviews with Jake Factor, my step-grandfather A.L. Epstein, and Jake's wife Rella. All interviews have similar but different details. For example, the number of cars varies from three to four. The people involved riding in different cars. The short version is on the night of July 1st, 1933, my step-granddad, A.L. Epstein, also known as Epi, John Jake the Barber Factor, my dad, Charles Redlick, Jake Factor's son and college friend of my dad, Jerome Factor, and his stepmother, Rella Cohen Factor, my grandmother, Mildred Epstein, and her sister from New York, reported by the chauffeur in his newspaper interview as being Catherine Hyman, a cousin of Jerome and my dad. To my knowledge, we were not related to the factors through marriage. I could be wrong. I've heard my dad mention his aunts Elsa and Florence, but not Catherine. Now this is a fuzzy picture of mom and her sister, Aunt Florence, Florence Hyman, H-E-I-M-A-N. They lived in New York. But let's operate on the premise that it's incorrect again with the credibility and accuracy of the press back then. I'm going with this version from the Chicago Daily Tribune, July 2nd, 1933. There were three cars in their party. Jake Factor's Duesenberg, driven by his son Jerome, with my dad as his passenger. The second car, driven by Jake Factor, with Epi. The third car was driven by a chauffeur, James Reddick, who worked for Epi. His passengers were my grandmother Mildred, her sister, whoever that was, and Rella Factor. They were out for a night of clubbing and gambling at the Dells, a roadhouse and mob run casino in Morton Grove, Illinois. One article says they were there to celebrate my great aunt's birthday. I thought it might have been to celebrate my dad's birthday on Saturday instead of his actual birthday on Monday, July the 3rd. They left the club around 1 a.m. Jake and Eppie's car was cut off by a speeding car and men with machine guns took them away. My dad and Jerome were ahead of them and they didn't know what happened. They were stopped for speeding at Dempster Road and Keeler Avenue by two Nile Center motorcycle cops. The chauffeur, James Reddick, in the last car saw something was going on ahead and pulled over not far from where the abduction was taking place. Their car was quickly overrun by more men with machine guns who told them to turn their backs and not look up or they would be shot. Reddick was clear to go and he drove up on the cops with the boys. Rella Factor and the other women were hysterical relating the story of the kidnapping of Jake Factor and Al Epstein. Epi was tossed out of the car at Harms Road and he found his way back to the rest of the group. Back at Epstein's residence at the Belden Stratford Hotel, Epi told his version of what happened. 
James Reddick, the chauffeur, was questioned and his version is much different from the ones given by Jake Factor and Epi. Reddick said he dropped my dad and Jerome off at the Dells at 9 a.m. with my dad's aunt Catherine Hyman. Unconfirmed. The other reports state that the kidnapping event was at 1 a.m. I wonder if the newspaper made a mistake with 9 a.m. instead of 9 p.m., which makes more sense. When I found the article about James Reddick, a bell went off in my mind. When I was in the Marine Corps, I was stationed in Vietnam with a James Reddick from Detroit. Could they have been related? Kidnappers Buck Henrinson, Eddie Schwabauer, Jimmy Tribble, and Charlie Icewagon Connors, all who worked for Roger Tuohy, surrounded Jake's car and took him in another waiting car and drove to Eddie Schwabauer's mother's house. The others in the party were released unharmed. This is the incident my dad told me about as a kid. When Schwabauer's mother saw the newspaper headlines in the morning, she told her son to get Jake out of her house. Schwabauer and Connors drove Jake Factor to a rented house in Bangs Lake, Illinois, where several of Tui's gang took turns keeping Jake company. When Jake got tired of talking with the gang, Henriksen hired comedy vaudeville entertainers Harry Gellis and Frankie Brown to entertain him. Jake spent the rest of his time playing cards and drinking. On July 12, 1933, Jake showed up in LaGrange, Illinois, and he flagged down a passing police car and told them, I'm Jake Factor, and I was kidnapped. The framing of Tui for the kidnapping began the next day on July 13th. The Cook County State's Attorney's Office Chief Investigator Daniel Tubbo Gilbert, who had a reputation for being corrupt, was already accusing the Tui gang for Factor's kidnapping with no evidence. Tui said that Gilbert hated him. Gilbert had known Roger Tui's brother Tommy when they were kids. They had some history. In 1923, Gilbert, then a beat cop, was shaking down bootleggers like Roger Tui. Tui refused to pay Gilbert's price for a barrel of beer. Gilbert wanted $5 a barrel and Tui offered $1.50 a barrel for protection. They argued about the protection price for six months. In 1933, Gilbert was under the influence of the outfit as well as being on the conspiracy to frame Roger Tuohy for Jake Factor's kidnapping. Still, in light of what was going on, the story of the kidnapping was beginning to unravel. Newspaper stories related the details of Jake Factor's financial schemes and people started to wonder if Factor had been kidnapped at all. Jake was working to get the public sympathetic to his side, as well as building a stronger case against Tui. Jake, using his contacts within the Tui gang, contacted a Tennessee moonshiner and mail thief, Isaac Costner. He was loosely associated with one of Tui's top guys, Basil Hugh Banghart. Jake told Costner he had himself kidnapped to avoid extradition back to England. Jake then offered Costner $25,000 to make the kidnapping look real. Jake wanted Banghart in on this scheme. Banghart was a professional car thief and also managed to escape from Atlanta Federal Prison more than one time. In 1933, Banghart escaped from Atlanta Federal Prison again, but this time went to Chicago and worked for Roger Tui as a gunslinger and a mail robber. In the summer of 1933, Factor, Costner, and Banghart met in the suburbs of Maywood, Illinois to talk about the plan. Banghart was suspicious of the scam. Factor was feeling the heat from the British government, which still wanted him extradited back to England. What Jake wanted Costner and Banghart to do was to call him with the FBI tapping the phone line and ask for an additional ransom of $25,000 cash payment. 
Banghart and Costner agreed. The next day, Costner called Factor's hotel suite while Tubbo Gilbert and FBI Special Agent Melvin Purvis listened on the call. Costner was on the other end of the telephone line. He identified himself as one of the kidnappers. Costner was asking when the second half of the ransom would be paid. Jake told Costner he was having trouble raising the money and to call him back in a day or two. After that call ended, Jake, to the shock of law enforcement, called a press conference and announced the new demand for more ransom money. Gilbert and Purvis were listening on the line to that press conference. The newspapers ran the story, and Jake Factor's story was again credible. When Costner and Banghart went to pick up the additional ransom, Chicago detectives set a trap. With an army of 250 men, two airplanes, 62 police squad cars, automatic weapons, and bombs to get the kidnappers. Banghart got wise to the trap and made a run for it. He managed to get through roadblocks and after being fired at by police, hitting his car several times, but no bullets hit Banghart. He managed to escape this army of cops and get away by hitchhiking back to Chicago. When Banghart opened the ransom envelope that was supposed to hold the $25,000 in ransom money, he got a huge shock. There was only $500 and some cut up newspapers. Factor was now under the safety of Al Capone, Chicago, but the highest powers in the country demanded his arrest. Factor fought extradition all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, but he had a weak case and deportation was inevitable. Just 24 hours before the court was to decide his fate, Factor had paid to have himself kidnapped and his case was postponed. U.S. laws required that a person who is not extradited within 60 days be released. Jake Factor managed to run out the clock and was not extradited. On February 2, 1943, Jake Factor was convicted in federal court in Cedar Rapids, Iowa sentenced to 10 years in prison and fined $10,000. Released from prison on February 9, 1949, Jake Factor was freed on parole after only serving six years of the 10-year sentence. And that was seven years after Jake and Rella were in Palm Springs in the family movies. Released from prison, Jake Factor took control of the Stardust Hotel Casino in Las Vegas in 1955, then the largest operation on the Vegas Strip. The casino's true owners, of course, were Chicago mob bosses Paul Rica, Tony Arcado, Murray Humphreys, and Sam Giancana. From 1955 to 1963, the length of Factor's tenure at the casino the U.S. Justice Department estimated that the Chicago outfit skimmed between 48 to 200 million dollars from the Stardust alone. In 1956, while Factor and the outfit were growing rich off the Stardust, Roger Tui hired a quirky, high-strung, but highly effective lawyer named Robert B. Johnstone to take his case. At the same time, the McClellan Committee was looking into the ties between the Teamsters, Las Vegas, organized crime, and the raid at the mob conclave in New York State, which awakened the FBI and brought them into the fight. Two years after Toohey's murder in 1962, Attorney General Robert Kennedy ordered his Justice Department to look into the highly suspect dealings of the Stardust Casino. Factor was still the owner on record, but had sold his interest in the casino portions of the hotel for a mere $7 million. Then, in December of that year, the INS, working with the FBI on Bobby Kennedy's order, informed Jake Factor that he was to be deported from the United States before the end of the month. Factor would be returned to England, where he was still a wanted felon as a result of his 1928 stock scam. Just 48 hours before the deportation, 
factor, John Kennedy's single largest personal political contributor was granted a full and complete presidential pardon, which allowed him to stay in the United States. The story hints that Factor was more than probably an informant for the Internal Revenue Service. It also investigates the murky world of presidential pardons, the last imperial power of the executive branch. The mob wasn't finished with Factor. Right after his pardon, Factor was involved in a vague, questionable financial plot to try and bail Teamster boss Jimmy Hoffa out of his seemingly endless financial problems in Florida real estate. He was also involved in a questionable stock transaction with Murray Humphreys. Jake Factor spent the remaining 20 years of his life as a benefactor to California's black ghettos. He wanted to make amends for all of the suffering it caused in his life. He spent millions of dollars building churches, gyms, parks, low-cost housing in the poverty-stricken ghettos. When he died, three United States Senators, the Mayor of Los Angeles, Tom Bradley, and former Governor of California, Edmund Pat Brown, waited in the rain to pay their respects. In the 1936 films taken at my grandparents' residence in Palm Springs, I found who I think is Jake and Rella Factor based on comparison of other photos. And of course, my dad never mentions Jake or Rella in his voiceover. He doesn't go into any details that might be a shady connection to the mob. I believe this is Rella Factor. You'll notice that Rella wasn't as camera shy as her husband Jake. All these people were connected somehow, and I couldn't figure out why they all came to Palm Springs at one time. Well, the common denominators that brought all these people together were, they all worked as performers or in the business side of the industry. Another was that most of the people in the film were Jewish. With Europe at war, the Jews in America were not going down without a fight. Meyer Lansky and Ben Bugsy Siegel were two Jewish gangsters who did their part against the Nazis in New York City in the mid-1930s. My dad says, we were a nice type group, implies to me, after reading several books on the subject, that they were part of the Kosher Nostra, the Jewish Mafia. Every family has a history. There might be old letters, photos, diaries, film footage buried in an attic with one or more members of your family. The lesson I learned was not to wait. Talk to older members of your families while they still have their memories. In my case, the discovery of those old 16 millimeter movies opened up a new chapter. Why did my parents never mention all these details? I'll never know. It was a nice tight group.